Hello guys, today with Alec uh, we are talking about estrogen. So my first question for Alec is um, what is actually the role of estrogen in male's body? So basically estrogen is a sex hormone and just like other sex hormone, it, hormones, it has a key role in modulating uh, libido, rectal functions, spermatogenesis, cognitive function, um, it modulates the raw system, so kidney function, fluid balance and whatnot. So it has a multi-functional uh, properties, obviously, just like all endocrine hormones. Uh, but uh, since we're playing with exogenous androgens that are usually substrate for the aromatase enzyme, meaning it, they convert to estrogen, whether that's uh, estradiol or estron or different form of estrogens, they do create estrogen, and that uh, you know impacts our body greatly. To various degrees obviously based off of the compound what we use duration dosage and whatnot and individual drug response which is very important um i would uh i would like to know that uh you know prior uh it was a trend back into you know 2012 13 and all the way up till a few years ago uh people in general in this industry were so anti-estrogen, uh, they they basically propagated heavy I, I, AI aromatase inhibitor usage, CIRMs, and uh, you know other f means of estrogen inhibition, uh, whether through you know uh, other compounds used such as boldenone or you know just overall slamming letrozole or whatever, uh, which basically uh, yielded a lot of uh, side effects in people, especially regarding hair loss, uh, uh, neurological issues, anxiety, stress, and whatnot. And now we're diving into the trend of uh, propagating pro-estrogen uh, uh, mediation. So people are letting their estrogen, you know, shoot up higher than uh, even in supraphysiological levels. And that has its own, uh, you know, subset of consequences, uh, which I'll get into uh, if you don't want to interject in between. <laughs> Just like uh, you basically told told what uh, I already wanted to say. So like back in the days, everyone was, I remember, afraid of estrogen. Even I was like, when I started my first cycle, like everyone was telling me, oh, you need to take a Remidex alongside with it because like otherwise you'll get gyno, you'll get high estrogen, you'll get a uh, puffy face, you'll hold a lot of water. So estrogen is bad. You need to take a Remidex, you know, or Letrozole. You need to cut out estrogen. Um, but yeah, then like, uh, of course, like I've came to a conclusion that, that like, that's not what I should do, that like estrogen is important, like it has uh, plenty of benefits, like including joint protection, hair protection, um, what is how to say, cardio protection, like it protects the cardiovascular system. If I, I know, if I know probably like it works also like an antioxidant, right? Um, and it uh, protects mm -hmm. your brain and so on, you know, so it has plenty of health benefits. But like you say, said nowadays, like everyone is uh, promoting, I mean, not everyone, but like there's a new trend, you know, instead of like uh, being afraid of estrogen like they were before. Now there are, there are like people like saying to you like, okay, so don't be afraid of estrogen. Estrogen is awesome. Like just let your estrogen to go as high as possible as soon as you, uh, as long as you don't get gyno, you don't need to control it because you'll get all these uh, health benefits mm -hmm. uh, from estrogen. But there's another catch here because like uh, as you talked about in uh, the podcast with vigorous steve uh estrogen like too high estrogen levels could also be dangerous like uh, estrogen could like um it plays a role in cancer it could uh, cause autoimmune diseases like you said like majority of autoimmune diseases are uh, have women so that's probably because they have higher estrogen levels right and uh, I, I've also heard that like mm -hmm. having higher estrogen levels predisposes you to a uh, high risk of developing uh, venous thromboembolism, which could also be uh, a pretty dangerous thing. So um, that's why I invited you to my podcast, because like I'm I didn't dive that deep into these details. So I wanted to ask you uh, that you are more like professional in these uh, uh, topics, you know, so how high should we allow our estrogen to go? so we get like as many benefits health and uh, performance like anabolism benefits from estrogen while not risking uh 
are held too much like so we don't so we get benefits with the least amount of uh, possible dangers from estrogen so how high would you allow your estrogen to go what would you say that it's an optimal range for the body I, I, I really like that you said also that you mentioned anabolism and that's one of the main thing that uh reasons why we need estrogen as well even in the context of bodybuilding uh, and that's essentially because it's it's a driver driver and agonist of IGF-1. So it's very important to have that there because IGF-1 is one of the main growth factors in the body that stimulates mTOR C1. Um, and we need that for cellular pr proliferation. But in the context of risk reward ratio, it's very individual based off of, you know, uh, some people like I'm going to, you know, take myself as an example. The first cycle that I tried uh, was testosterone at 500 mix with a pharmaceutical nandrolone, uh, I think 300 mix, and I had some D-ball in there. And I used uh, Arimidex actually, because, you know, the forum and everything, uh, as you said, uh, they were propagating it. Um, and essentially, I started getting uh, gyno, even when I did uh, blood work, my estrogen was around 45 pgml, and that was enough at that time to uh, mediate gyno for me. And that, that was partially due to d converting to methyl estradiol, which is a more potent agonist of the estrogen receptor alpha. And even Arimidex was not enough to save me in that situation. But uh, interestingly, so now without like if, if I let my estrogen go upwards to 50, 55 pgml, which is, you know, still within the high end of the reference range, I don't get gyno. So it's not just a matter of overall like estradiol, how high it is, but overall estrogen in our body, because there are different forms of estrogen and they all agonize the estrogen receptor alpha and they do have estrogenic transcription. So it's not just looking at estradiol, which people in blood work, Basically, um, they, they they do that and, and engage their their uh, they assess their uh, AI use based off of that. So even though I don't like to uh, use uh, to use uh, gyno as a reference point, uh, usually we want to look at overall picture. So how we're feeling, how we're whether we're retaining water, what our, how uh, our blood blood pressure is, whether it's going high or not. So taking into consideration everything and based off of that, determine whether we need to lower it a bit or not. In general, you know, within 30 to 50 pgml is like a, a relatively safe uh, range to be at. But definitely we don't want to be super physiological because like people say, oh, you're an androgen, right? And you need a, a perfect ratio of estrogen to androgens. But if we go off of that, we cannot take one endocrine hormone and shoot it up sky high. And if we go off of ratios, we need to basically have super physiological levels of everything because like we're blasting androgen. So that concept really doesn't sit with me. And basically we'd want to be within the reference range, but you know, not, not above it essentially. But if okay. you do get side effects, there are, you know, a notorious for being estrogen related, obviously, even if you're within the range, you'd want to lower it. So it's individual, but still within the reference range. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, since you mentioned like other forms of estrogen, like uh, what is estrol and uh, estra, how is the third one? Estron, um, methyl, and... th there are many, methyl estradiol, yeah. estron. But, but the uh, three main ones are this, you know, the three, right? Or... Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, it's estron, estradiol, can you, can you uh, methyl estrogen. Them, can you actually measure them on blood work? Are they there any yes. lab that? Uh -huh, okay. Mm -hmm. So because yes. in my lab there is all, only an option to check estradiol. You can't actually check estron or other forms of estrogen. So um, yeah, I, I was uh -huh. just curious. Here, here, here we do have um, total estrogens, and you can go off of that and subtract. Estradiol, like you can measure estradiol and total estrogens and basically uh, subtract the estradiol and you can basically gauge where like where the other numbers are coming from. But we do have some private labs here testing estron as well. Um, and I think they do test another form, but 
I know Estron is is being tested because like in um, if you look up skin uh, well not skin uh, I mean organ biopsies especially in breast cancer, uh, Estron is usually sky high. It's not just estradiol. And it, what's interesting is, for example, a lot of androgens do aromatize into estrogen, um, and they basically aromatize into estrogen. And estrogen, even though it's a weaker estrogen, it still has uh, estrogenic transcription, and also it can convert into estradiol directly within tissues via an enzyme called 17 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. And once it does that, you basically have estradiol within your tissues being uh, built build up, but it would not reflect serum levels because it's within tissues. So that's also something interested, interesting uh, that uh, people tend to neglect and they can get like gyno, even though their E2 is like within the reference range, like it would be 30, but they're getting gyno, but they're, they don't account for other, like for Eshon, for example, maybe converting it into estradiol within tissues or, you know, using something like Debo, like I did, and, you know, having methyl estradiol being in our system and which is way stronger than just E2. So you have to factor in everything when you're assessing your overall estrogen burden. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So um, since we... As I already mentioned before, like that, I, I mentioned it on a fast. So the dangers of having high estrogen, I don't think you covered that uh, before. So I would uh, ask you to cover it more into detail. So what are actually the dangers if we just like allow our estrogen to go too high for too long? Like, let's say if I let my estrogen to go up to like uh, 200 uh, for longer periods of time, what am I actually risking besides uh, gyno and uh, water retention? Yeah, and, and clotting, obviously, because you mentioned that as well. Yeah. Um, because you and I have autoimmune issues. Uh, well, you're not, you're in remission, so you're good right now. But in general, uh, that's a huge uh, topic and, 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 and realistic problem. Because, and, uh, and not just from immunomodulation uh, aspect, also the raw system. So, like, there's this pathway called the Janus kinase pathway, JAKSTAT, um, which is one of the main pathways for inflammation in our system. Um, it basically uh, gets agonized via estrogen and it can induce hair loss. It can, it, it has a key role in, um, in cancer development, in things like uh, ulcerative colitis, arthritis. So um, there are a lot of problems that estrogen directly mediates and you know, it, it can cause problems like that. Cancers obviously not need to, you know, go further into that. It can, you know, it can potentiate cancer development, um, neurological implications. So like estrogen can have a, a you know, a blatant effect on our mood, our, on our libido, on our cognitive function. Even, you, you know, people are talking about its neuroprotective effects, but that's in, like when they look at studies, for example, when they take an androgen and they're not introducing an estrogen when they're when the individual is estrogen deficient and you know has a lot of androgens, they have neurological implications negative. They add estrogen and they attenuate them and they conclude that estrogen is neuroprotective, but they uh, they don't take into account that they're basically taking extreme uh, situations, one situation where they're estrogen deprived. And then they add estrogen and basically have like a normal level and they make that conclusion. But it's not like forever. It's not dose dependent. It's not linear. You cannot take more or have more estrogen and, and expect more neuroprotection or cardioprotection or whatever. It just doesn't work like that. So, for example, cortisol is very important for uh, end inflammation, for modulating the immune system and whatnot. But if you let it, let it go super physiological, you'll get Cushing syndrome, you'll have adrenal fatigue, you'll have thyroid problems. So it's not that more is better, you know. And a lot of these studies are, um, they're flawed like that. Their conclusions are taking extremes and they make, you know, indefinite uh, statements that are, you know, just untrue. Okay, so... 
Uh, is there anything? Do you want to add something? Yeah, I have one more question, um, and that is like, uh, since we are already talking mm -hmm. about the estrogen, so uh, why exactly do nandrolone derivatives um, potentiate the aromatization from testosterone? Because like usually, uh, guys who use like testosterone, they don't take it into account that like uh, when they add, for example, nandrolone to it, they actually potentiate the aromatization and they get much more conversion to estrogen than if they would just uh, run testosterone by itself, you know? Uh, even though DECA does not uh, convert to mm -hmm. estrogen that much, it actually does potentiate the aromatization. So why is that so? Could you explain this a little bit more into detail? Um, I've seen quite a lot of research suggesting that this happens because the synthetic progestins, which are metabolites of nandrolone, and nandrolone itself can act as a ligand, so basically can bind to the estrogen receptor alpha, and essentially agonize the receptor so it can be estrogenic in itself without having to be a substrate for the aromatase enzyme it doesn't have to convert to estrogen mm. for it to to modulate estrogenic effects that's the thing i've had that happen with uh with various nandrolones uh meant uh nandrolone decanoate so deca and even tren where even though estrogen was never above reference range i would get uh, depression, gyno, anxiety, all of those super physiological estrogenic uh, side effects. And even aromatase inhibitors would not prevent this, especially with DECA and TREN. I've noticed that, and TREN does not aromatase at all. But being a synthetic progestin, you know, we're not taking into account the metabolites and how these drugs impact the receptors directly. They can one so like one hormone can act as a ligand for another receptor such as for example um a amsh alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone when we take um uh, you know melanotan for example right mm -hmm. well <clears throat> even though the main you know effect it, it, it has to increase melanocyte uh, melanin production via melanocortin receptor one it binds to the hrp neurons in the brain which are not related and it inhibits appetite right so even though we're taking a certain hormone it doesn't mean that it cannot do other functions have other functions uh, as well ACTH for example it can also uh, stimulate melanin production that's why a lot of you know times people with Edison disease can have hyperpigmentation so it's very interesting but uh, you know I, I always when I research these compounds uh, I look at their metabolites and basically research what they do individually in our body just so I can see whether something that uh, it's like, it's, um, it logically doesn't make sense, but still happens. Like, even if I try to find uh, a pattern and usually I find it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, moving on to the next thing that I wanted to ask you is... Uh, to say estrogen control so how would be like the smartest approach for someone to control estrogen like would you uh, just like um, balance out the testosterone to dht ratios for for people that let's say don't have uh, problems uh, with uh, hair loss and like for example me i like to run dht compounds so usually i balance out my estrogen by just like combining like uh, test to prim or test to masteron or test to winstrol in uh, uh, correct ratio but like uh, for some others that maybe have like problems with hair loss and like you, you avoid um, um, DHT compounds, you know, um, like mm -hmm. how would you control estrogen? Would you actually add in an aromatase inhibitor? If yes, which one would you use? Like examistin, would you use uh, nasrozole, would you use uh, letrozole? Like probably also it depends on like how high estrogen it is, but like um, how would you approach like mm -hmm. controlling estrogen in general? So first, I would try to not get myself to a place where I need um, estrogen inhibition. So you're doing, you know, a relatively smart move. You're taking things that are like a DHT deriv derivatives that have effect on, you know, attenuating estrogen uh, uh, levels within tissues, such as Masseron, for example. Um, but because that you know that doesn't fit within my my narrative and my goals the the only thing that i can do other than avoiding you know compounds that are substrate for the aromatase enzyme 
uh, is basically introduce an aromatase inhibitor. Now, um, as far as which one, based off of the studies and you know the data that we have, aromasin seems to be the best bang for your buck in regards to side effects versus res uh, you know effects ratio. It has the least impact on lipid profile. Uh, it's suicidal, so it basically kills off the enzyme itself. It's not just a blocking it. So there's no rebound effect when we stop it, such as with uh, Arimidex or Letrozole, because they're type 1 inhibitors, where Aromacin is a type 2. Um, so that's good. Uh, and also, it's, it's relatively easy to uh, micromanage. So uh, if... Um, I, I and also blood work is one of the metrics that is obviously important to look at where we're timing uh, as we're dosing it. But like I would start super low uh, in an every other day sh dosing schedule and then you know titrate up or down depending on how I feel and uh, what I see on the blood work. Mm -hmm. And how about the like uh, nandrolone solo cycles or like doing very very low tests just for sufficient estradiol levels and then adding on top like eq or something like that um how are you about that like mm -hmm. have, yeah have the, i think tried, uh, have you so nandrol on only cycles oh no continue yes yes uh yeah um i, I have tried nandrol on solo cycles simply due to trying to have a low androgenic environment because nandrolone is, you know, significantly less androgenic than testosterone and other uh, anabolics. Um, so that in itself, for me, um, did yield, you know, great results with, you know, very minimal estrogenic uh, effects. If I pair it with testosterone, however, I do get gyno and, you know, every other estrogenic uh, type of side effect. Uh, boldenone, I really like because... Um, it's, it converts to it has a metabolite 17 beta hydroxy hexamestane or methylene boldenone, which depending on the individual, if some are more likely to have more of this metabolite than others, uh, for me it does act as an AI to you know at a, a certain degree where it doesn't crash as my estrogen, but it helps me you know manage the the effects of it. So. Uh, adding sm a small dose of EQ is very beneficial for me. Uh, it dries me out, gives me, you know, extra additional anabolism and fullness while mitigating, you know, bloat and water tension and other things from, uh, you know, aromatizing uh, androgens. So I do like that, um, that strategy a lot. Now, for some people, I've seen EQ being too potent in this regard and actually crashing their estrogen levels. Um, it's not that common, but I see it, so I have to note it. Uh, even Jeremy Bundy had a video where like, he add, added 300 mg on top of his HRT, and his estrogen was obliterated. <clears throat> so um, that's something to have in mind, but uh, that's one, if, you know, one good strategy to go, go about it and also get extra anabolism out of it. Because CQ is, you know, an anabolic, so uh, it would yield uh, additional uh, benefits, uh, assuming one can tolerate it. But yeah, uh, I would, I would go that route. I, I take that route personally myself. Interesting. Um, is there anything more that you want to add? If uh, not, then you can just make like a short conclusion of uh, what we talked today. So. Uh, preferably, like to say again, like where should we keep our estrogen and all that, you know. Right. So in general, people need to try to avoid overly generalizing statements and claims. They're not one size fits all things. We need to just understand how hormones work, how certain androgens work, and just be aware of what can happen and to what degree and play around with it. So in general, we want to have physiological levels of estrogen um, and, and basically monitor every possible uh, side effect potential that can happen from having too much of an agonism at the estrogen receptor, you know, the symptoms such as, you know, neurological symptoms, depression, you know, low libido, um, you know, depression, anxiety, 
uh, water tension, bloating, uh, from an immune system standpoint, you know, uh, gut issues like indigestion, uh, bloating, uh, joint pain, things like that, which joint pain can happen with low estrogen as well, but it's different when you have like inflammation where like you have uh, synovial fluid building up around the joints and it's a different type of inflammation. Um, but overall, you need to just look at every biomarker, both subjective and objective on paper. Uh, look at the numbers, be within the reference scale, within like from 30 pgml upwards to 50. And, you know, based off of that, micromanage it till you feel your best, perform your best, and grow the best, obviously, because we're trying to pack on size. But outside of that, you know, it's a matter of just understanding things. When you're looking at, you know, synthetic androgens <coughs> that are, may or may not be substrate for the aromatase enzyme, Take into con consideration the synthetic metabolites of them, look them up and see whether they also have estrogenic effects or not. You know, when you're, you know, uh, basically forming your cycle, because that will have, uh, you know, a key role in how things will turn out when you actually run the cycle. Okay, so I think that's pretty much it for today. Thank you, Alec, for being on my podcast. Uh, you guys don't forget to check him out on Instagram. I'll put uh, his link down below. Uh, I mean, hero screen. So, uh, for you guys, don't forget to like, subscribe, comment to support the channel's growth, and like always, see you in next video. Thanks, bro.